All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Iowa Ideas. Uh, this is uh, session five, Issues and Achievement on the Education Track. Um, before we get started, I'd like to uh, allow for a brief uh, word from our sponsor, Inclusive ICR. Hi friends, Angelica Veneta, co-chair of Inclusive ICR. We are a coalition of over 220 employers in Eastern Iowa, all working together to grow the diversity and inclusion of our workforce, to create a space where employees feel a sense of belonging, included, and valued. Inclusive ICR is a proud sponsor of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion track of the Iowa Ideas Conference. As you participate today, be sure to connect with other Inclusive ICR champions, as we'd love to share information with you about our upcoming coalition meetings, projects, and how our work is impacting positive social change in our region. Be sure to check out our website at inclusiveicr.org for upcoming events and our e-newsletter. Thank you and have a great conference. All right, and with that, I'll get started here. <clears throat> uh, education has long been a strength of the state of Iowa. Uh, for those of you who remember the state quarters, Iowa's, which was released in 2004, featured an image of a one-room schoolhouse based on a Grant Wood painting and the words, Foundation in Education. Despite strengths in areas like SAT scores and graduation rates, uh, Iowa has been passed in state rankings of education. And of course, the pandemic has had a significant impact on education in Iowa and across the country. Achievement gaps persist between different groups of students, including those facing economic hardship, Black and Hispanic students, ESL students, and those with an individualized education plan. Um, to discuss these issues and more, with me here today are Lori Phelan, President and CEO of Iowa Jobs for America's Graduates, or IJAG, Matt Degner, Superintendent of Iowa City Schools, Brad Niebling, Bureau Chief for Learner Strategies and Supports at the Iowa Department of Education, and to Carlos Anderson, Director of Educational Talent Search at the University of Northern Iowa Center for Urban Education, or UNIQ. Welcome all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I suppose I'd like to begin uh, with the pandemic, since that seems to be an all-encompassing topic. Um, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted student achievement? And has the achievement gap or the gap between uh, marginalized students and, and others widened? Uh, and how can we help students make up the ground if so? I'll uh, open that up to whoever would like to, to take that first. Sure, I, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, uh, as we looked at the, the data from this last school year, um, from some of the uh, required assessments that schools have to administer for grades three through eight and, and in high school as well, um, overall, uh, we we saw a drop in the number and percentage of students that are proficient in both literacy and math. Um, math was a little more um, consistent in terms of that drop in those percentage of students who are proficient. Uh, English language arts was mixed. There is um, in some grade levels we actually saw some increase in proficiency, and others a decrease. But overall. Um, it, We've seen, as would be expected, a, a negative impact of the pandemic on student achievement. Um, and uh, some of those gaps that you mentioned between different uh, subgroups of students, in many cases, mirrored that overall drop. So we actually saw an increase in some of those achievement gaps uh, for different subgroups of students. I guess if I jumped in, Sam, I'd say um, in IJEG, we serve a population of students that um, Typically school systems would say they're at risk, but coming from uh, kind of a tumultuous background and then struggling in school too. And the pandemic, I did two things. Uh, one, um, got them further behind because many of them didn't have the technology connections but our school systems, I think work really hard to try to uh, mitigate that. Uh, but when students were disconnected, they got kind of lost in their own worlds, if you will, and home life was not supportive either in many cases. So not only did they get behind academically, but they also lost some of those connections that are so important about relationship and 
and, um, and some people that they know they could talk to in a safe environment that often is available to them every day in school. So the population that I serve that economically disadvantaged and subpopulations um, were probably hurt the hardest and will be recovering the, for the longest period of time. So um, even when the pandemic is in their control, it really is uh, still a long reach to getting back to any sense of normalcy for, for um, many of our populations of students. Matt, is that something that you observed as well in Iowa City Schools? Yeah, thanks. Uh, good afternoon again, everybody. Um, I wouldn't disagree with any of those statements. I think we'd be you know, lying to ourselves to say we're going to go through a global pandemic and that we're not going to see significant impacts on our on our young kids. Um, and especially when we look at our structurally disadvantaged students, you know, we know that anything that we do to impact the system, uh, if we want to think about from an intentional positive aspect or when something happens negatively to our system, how that's going to affect, uh, you know, those groups of students. And so certainly, you know, I'd agree with with Lori's comments there, you know, that that's going to hit them harder, be a longer period of time for recovery. And our job as educators in the institution is to figure out now how do we how do we try to address that? Also understanding that we're not through it yet, right? I mean, there's still impacts that are being felt from that. And so while we're trying to move into some recovery mode and um, trying to put a lot of, of plans and systems into place for that, we're still seeing, um, you know, some of the consequences of, of working through that. I also think there's some opportunities yeah. uh, that, that came through uh, from the pandemic for us to look at, um, but we need to be real about the challenges and then also figure out what can we learn uh, from those different opportunities presented to us and, and try to lead um, differently, teach differently, um, learn differently, and, and try to come together better as a community. Um, when we talk about that social emotional impact, that was a need we knew before the uh, global uh, pandemic, but that it's probably just been highlighted or exacerbated uh, right. throughout that. And I think that's a new challenge that, the, the, you know, that educators and schools in Iowa are, are willing to take on and that we want our institutions to be able to fix and be able to work uh, for a better tomorrow uh, on those different things. And so that's another aspect I would think about that has probably been elevated in importance and, and a lot more attention brought to, to that issue, uh, which in some ways a positive, right? We're more in tune to that. We're more comfortable having those conversations, more able to recognize needs. And then if we can better recognize the needs, we can better align support. I, I would have to uh, kind of piggyback on what everyone has said. Um, I think that is you know, the, the, uh, the things that are pretty much the obvious as far as the impact of the pandemic. Um, I think another piece too, because I know Sam, you asked the question of like that, that gap increasing, right? And I think that gap was increasing, you know, prior to the pandemic, right? And so yeah. now um, what it does is just really kind of, you know, sped that process up, you know? And so I think Matt has some great points as far as for us, um, especially working in education in my my world, uh, you know, we're more of a support, um, just looking at like the different things, right? And so for me personally, I think the one thing that I did know through the pandemic is that our children are so heavily connected to technology, right? You know, but when you think about that, right? I didn't think Zoom was engaging, right? You know, we lost a lot of our kids um, through that platform, right? And, and so the question is why, right? And so again, I think Matt posed some great questions that I ask all the time. When we look at the, the institutional education, um, it's really primitive, right? So being um, really, really innovative on how we engage our students now is gonna really be kind of the determining factor of how we get them back, right? We lost them for 18 months and some students are even, you know, still haven't recovered, right? So I know enrollment is, ha has been an issue, attendance has been an issue. Uh, I know there's districts who, students who, you know, they haven't heard from since last March, right? And so all these different factors are now um, just a, a ball of mess for, our education system, and I think, I think other professionals, and for me, you know, one person that's solution based, I think just first thinking about um, how we how we engage our students is going to be the most important thing, right? And then once they're engaged, we can ensure that they're actually going to learn, right? And then increase the proficiency of, you know, whatever expectations we have for uh, the students in our school system, right? And I think that's something that for me, um, you know, I don't have an answer. I don't think anybody has an answer, but that's something I think that we need to really pay attention to, so. And, and, and what can be done to help those students who may have fallen through the cracks or, uh, you know, ha uh, reaching out to them to, to try and um, help bring them back? I'm not sure uh, mm -hmm. if, if there's an easy answer there, of course, but. Yeah, Ian, I'd Sam, I don't. Go oh, ahead, sorry, Matt. 
No, uh, go Matt. Well, I was going to say, you kind of started with Iowa's history and education, right? And I don't think in Iowa, we've all of a sudden like forgotten how to do teach and learning or that we've gotten worse at doing teach and learning. I think what's what's happened to us if we're real with ourselves, is, you know, we're receiving more students that we're less successful with. And so when we talk about who our system's designed for and what that system was designed to do and who it was successful with, uh, Iowa's becoming more diverse. Iowa City's becoming more diverse. And so what we're really trying to do is reach a different learner. And we're trying to make sure that we're getting better at teaching learning practices. But if we really are honest about where our growth comes from, it comes from our black and brown students and from our poor students. That's the growth in our district uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. It's not, it doesn't encompass all of it, um, but, it, but it is a large portion of it. And so really the question we have to answer is, I don't think it's students that have fallen through the cracks. I think it's students that are right there in front of us that we're trying to develop ways about how to be better educators for and how to reach them uh, in new and different ways. Um, and the challenge is different now. I think the you know, the list continues to get longer for education about the things we're asked to be successful with. Um, the monitoring has gotten better. I think we know more about our students. We know more about their skill level. And so I think the question is different. And I think the solutions have to adjust to be different with that, too. So I just maybe reframe it in that way a little bit about how we continue to think about this and have a conversation. The Iowa of today is different than the, the Iowa of the past. And the Iowa City of today is different than the Iowa City of the past. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I agree 100%, Matt. And I think, too, um, the students that have kind of uh, um, dropped out but are still coming to school, a lot of those are the young people you just spoke about. I mean, they're, they are wanting to uh, be there for social reasons, if nothing else. And how do we reach them differently than we have in the past? I think that is also um, one of our institutional challenges. So we, we don't make massive radical changes in education and they kind of go slow, but we've learned a lot, I think over the years about the value of partnership and uh, that we don't have to do it alone in our schools and try to figure it out alone, that partnerships with nonprofit organizations, for example, and allowing them to come in and opening our walls to our communities differently than we've had before. I remember back in the day, there was a report called uh, a school, Schools Without Walls, and it was kind of like this dream, this radical dream, but now we know that we have to do that to bring in a different voice and for us to be able to learn differently and, and not have to be the sage on the stage, but sometimes even letting our students lead us into those tough conversations that are about how do we reach and teach you differently. Uh, one I, theme. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna to say, agree with what's been shared um, and to a point that Matt made earlier. Um, uh, if you looked at uh, some of the national assessments 20, 25 years ago, Iowa was consistently in the top five um, performing states. And if you look at those data over time, our performance on those tests, the actual how students are doing on the tests hasn't changed a whole lot. But what's changed is a lot of other states have leapfrogged us. And it's not all about that test. It's not all about what other states are doing, but rather just a self-reflection of, I think Matt, you pointed out, our students are changing, so are we changing? And, and that's difficult to do, no doubt, um, especially when we've had such a, a, a great history a uh, fine history of uh, providing quality education for our communities. Um, change is difficult, but I think that's what's upon us. And the last thing I would say on this point anyway, uh, is um, how do we engage students? Um, uh, there are a lot of ideas uh, for that. Uh, I think the where research sort of points us, I think, is um, one of the most important things, one of the most powerful things that schools can provide that they've got control over is relationships between teachers and their students. And it's pretty consistently across the board, that's got the biggest impact on student performance over anything else a school can do. So it's not that the details of school don't matter, they absolutely matter, but having at least one adult in that school that a student uh, can say, that adult believes in me, I've got a positive relationship with that adult, is gonna go miles down the road to getting students engaged. Yeah, I, think, I think just to piggyback on that too, Brad, I always say it's about representation, right? You know, I myself um, leading the program that is in that support role and how important um, the staff that I hire and, and the positioning of those folks is 
to, you know, the, the really the vitality of our students is like major. And then also too, I, I think that something that I look at also for, you know, not only our school district here locally, but across the board. I mean, I, I was in the high school um, K through 12 system in California for many, many, many years, right? And so really how we compensate the people that are in those support roles, right? Because there are people in the community who are respected and could be very valuable to our buildings. But again, they might, might not have a certification, right? But there are there are roles in our district that just don't pay well, right? That 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 really could be that connector mm-hmm. for really helping our students, right? And so I think again, when we talk about the best of money and how budgets are spent throughout districts, I mean, you know, what's what's more valuable to me, right? You know, and so again, I think those are the things that um, for me personally I see that you know really needs an overhaul, right? You know, there's people in, in central offices making six figures, right? Then we got people that's in the building in the in the trenches in the ground. That's, you know, really paying their bills, right? So again, you know, just think about, you know, how that changes because that representation is so important. And, I, and again, those people are the people that really have the most impact. Mm-hmm. When I like what Brad said around the relationships aspect, right? I mean, the research shows it to us. And when we think about what's happened here over the last 18 months or during this pandemic, building those relationships became a lot more difficult, Right. So when you want to think think about what are the things that we weren't able to do that we know have a large impact into our system or that were compromised in our ability about how to do them for a period of time, it was a form of those relationships with kids. And I think that's what we're seeing back this fall is like kids are desperate for those. They want them. Our adults want to form them. But getting that back on track in in some kind of a meaningful, consistent way doesn't just happen overnight. We, We know we invest deep in those relationships and that's going to take time to bring those components back. So when Lori was talking at the beginning about how we, you know, develop, you know, year long recovery, long term recovery, that those aren't just short challenges because relationships aren't short, right? Those, those take time to develop and trust to be gained and, and delivered on. So I really think that key point of those relationships, that is a huge indicator we do it. And then De Carlos makes the point about, okay, well, who can make those relationships with students, right? And how do we make sure those people are in our system, that they're representative of the students that they serve, that they feel like they have common interests and can connect? And then how are we built as a system to be able to recruit the people we need to be able to do that? If you can go to um, Target or you can go to another service industry in town and make a better living wage, that makes it really difficult for schools uh, to be able to recruit those effective people to do that with our kids. And I want to give a standing ovation, that relationship piece. It's just that, um, you know, for the, and, and, and again, back to our systems of how we educate, you know, we've got bells and structures and all of these things that still need to be reexamined. Because if you take the population that we work with, I, I always, I used to say it was a joke, but it's not really. If you spent half the year just building relationships with kids, no content, none of the tests, none of the exams, just really focusing on kids, their lives, their futures, their hopes and dreams they could complete all the content that they would have had the full year in the second half of the year, just because they know somebody cares and they want to see the relevance and they've gotten to see that relevance differently than they had in the past. America's Promise came out with a report almost a year ago now called the Yes Project. And it was about the student's voice on how, what would help make you successful. And it ended up with three major things. Help me know, help me uh, really be ready know the things that are going to be expected of me out in the real world. And then make sure I'm connected to some of these people that live in my community, in my state, in my world, and let me have experiences with them. And the third one was supported. And that meant not just when I graduate, you hand me your diploma and I leave, but help me be supported in having those connected relationships and my community and back with my school so that when I leave it as a senior, it's not bye, I'll never see you again. I'm coming back in to help influence the others that need to come along too. So kind of a cool opportunity, but it's it all has that linear line. Um, uh, Matt and Brad, what you just said about relationships, it that matters more than anything else. Are there ways in which the pandemic has impacted students' plans to, you know, after after school. Um, are we seeing changes in um, decisions to to enroll in college versus pursue careers uh, outside of higher education? I know there was something called the so-called uh, was it, uh, the enrollment gap um, because I think. Uh... Speaking just from a higher ed perspective, we are seeing a decline 
um, in enrollment. And I think, again, it just goes back to what everybody is saying on the panel is just that, you know, the way that our students, the way, the way that our students look are, is changing, it's evolving, right? The students that we're recruiting, you know, the same students we were recruiting 20 years ago, right? Even from the University of North Iowa, we look at all of our higher, higher ed institutions and enrollment decrease, it still goes back to the relationships, you know, the representation. Um, again, I myself as a black male, I think I talked to you, Sam, again, we, you know, uh, Warhawk alumni, you know, throughout my entire K through 12 experience, I, I had one black male teacher, right? And so when you think about that, you know, here I am, you know, 40 plus, right? And I still remember that, right? So again, um, when we go to recruit, right? It's, again, I'm a former athlete, right? I, you typically go to the schools that make us feel the best, right? Make us most comfortable, you know? And it's the same thing for traditional students, right? So therefore, if I know that, hey, there's nobody at the school that cares for me, um, and even with my children, that's one of the biggest things I say is, well, how do they make you feel? Um, and so if I know I can go to, as I mentioned before, John Deere's or Target and make X amount of dollars, um, and I, you know, I have a daughter right now, I'm kind of going through, it. it still comes back to that education, right? You know, when it comes down to the nitty gritty. And I think that that's something that we're, we're missing in that process is the opportunity to, to, to build that comfort, right? So I could, I think the biggest thing, you know, working in higher education, I said all the time is that we want our students to get done uh, with a degree with the least amount of debt, right? And so that's something that, um, you know, again, the pandemic, I know data really can't reflect that at this point, but that's something that we will see is that the students are choosing to make money versus waste money, right? So. Yeah, I, I think you're right, totally. And what we're seeing um, in our worlds and working with business and industry is that they're providing some opportunities for kids to learn and earn, right? While they're still in high school. And when that can happen through whether it's an apprenticeship or an internship or a limited term work experience, those young folks get a chance to learn about that industry. And it really does get them to focus a little bit more on some of their academics because they want to cross that first finish line of graduation. And then move on. And I'd also say that some of our businesses are strongly encouraging that students stay in school to get that next piece. So that connectivity between um, learning on the job and learning at school, I think has to be tightened up a bit, you know, looking more at what are those competencies or standards that they might be learning in that industry that could count for some uh, academic level credit. And I've got to give a little bit of an applause to the Department of Ed because they're really digging into that, some of that stuff. I'd say even uncomfortably digging into it for themselves. And um, not, by all means, not all the way there, but I think they're listening to some of their districts um, around the state that uh, need that help and uh, are trying to find ways. But I, I agree that uh, more of our young people can't go into debt, at least the population I observe, cannot go into debt. And and they're needing to support their family in some cases. So if they can learn and earn together, they're gonna to do it. Yeah, I think this one's kind of like a point that Carlos made you know, earlier as well about, did the pandemic just maybe accelerate things we were already seeing a little bit, right? And I think that's you know speaking to this issue as well that it either accelerated or puts a spotlight on it, but you know, and I think that's when I look at our K-12 system and what we you know need to do a better job of is you know, and Lori's a big partner in this work. Um, and, and she pointed out the Department of Ed and Brad's work, you know, about trying to uncomfortably ask ourselves these questions about how are we giving kids knowledgeable pathways for what they want to pursue, what their options are, you know, just going to college isn't enough, right? I mean, like, what is our ticket to go do? You know, what kind of experiences that we provide on the inside and may help them make an informed decision about what that next step looks like. And, and the landscape has changed around that, right? I mean, we went through some portrait of the graduate work here last spring of 2020. And, or excuse me, of 2021 and really looked at like, what are the core competencies we want our students to know? And we identified six different core competencies that, you know, are kind of outside of maybe what our stand, you know, our core standards that we need to teach are, but they're necessary skills. They're essential skills for our kids to be successful, you know, into this, into this next economy. And so um, I think that is the next challenge. And I don't think it was necessarily brought on by COVID. I think COVID's probably exposed you know, that hole again and said, hey, this is a, this is something we're going to have to answer as a society here because uh, we're seeing a shift in, in how people are thinking about this next step. Um, I'd like to go back to a, a point that was raised earlier um, about the, the changing um, demographics of, of Iowa. 
um, and the census uh, census data just came out not too long ago, showing uh, large growth in Iowa's urban areas. Um, and Matt, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how the Iowa City School District is uh, preparing for larger numbers of, of students in its uh, in its facilities planning, um, and whether that's uh, a, a way that we can help address achievement. Sure. So. Put a little plug here. We'd like to encourage everybody to go vote on November 2nd. Uh, we do have a PEPL and uh, SAVE um, extension that we're, we're looking at there to extend the PEPL levy for another 10 years and then to match um, the state one cent sales tax to what the legislature extended it through 2050. Um, and really, those are important to us. You know, there's no new tax uh, to the community, no new ask for money, but those are two important extensions for us. And, and how that really relates to the teach and learning aspect is, is kind of twofold. If we don't have those uh, provisions in place, that means that some of those operational components we have to put into our general fund, which is uh, really where we pay for most of our people that serve our kids, right? So 83 cents of every dollar for us is spent on a person uh, in the district through that general fund. And if those expenses that are traditional operational costs get moved into that, you can tell we're not going to be able to support as many folks in our system. So, so that's important for us that way to keep those life cycle projects going. Things you think about like transportation, HVAC needs, but then really, really the exciting part of it, the, the second part of the conversation is how we re-envision our learning spaces for uh, our, the next generation of our students. And really, we went through a, a facility master plan the first uh, go around here. We just completed it under time and under budget in eight and a half years, a project, you know, slated list that we thought would take 10 years. Uh, and that was just to kind of get us to a basic need standpoint, just to deal with that growth that you were speaking about there, that we had just grown so fast and there were so many needs that we had to put together a long-term plan to address things like air conditioning and sufficient classroom space to get kids out of portables. Now we're in a position where we need to make sure we stay ahead of the curve on that. We know that we continue to grow. We've been in a uh, growing enrollment district for almost 20 years. Last year was an anom anomaly with, with COVID seeing it a dip in our enrollment, but that hasn't been a norm here in Iowa City. We're back, we feel like, ready to certify enrollment tomorrow, be back to a, a growing state again, um, or growing status again here in the district. But, but considering all of those things and staying ahead of the curve, then what do we want to do from a teach and learning standpoint? And how do our facilities reflect that? And we need to have some big conversations around uh, whether it be uh, grade level configuration, uh, in, intentionally looking at early childhood education, we know that that's a that's a large need for a lot of families, and that we've somewhat saturated the market on a half day experience for families that can transport our kids. Well, that doesn't reach our demographic of, of families very well. There's a whole lot of families that need access to early childhood education that a half day model where the district doesn't do transportation doesn't work for. When we talk about those secondary students and are they enrolling into college or what are they doing. Um, I think that speaks to the programming opportunities that we decide to bring forth in our spaces and then how are our spaces outfitted to make sure we can support those programming opportunities. The social, emotional, mental health awareness, we've talked about a couple of times. Uh, how do we re-envision, you know, what everybody thinks is traditional school buildings uh, to support, you know, that in a, in a different way and spaces to, to be able to have conversation and uh, feel connected, you know, to an environment rather than maybe what a traditional brick and mortar school uh, looks like all the time. We support the whole child. So looking at those extracurricular and fine arts experiences. So I think there's a whole host of things there. You guys could get me going on our PEPL and SAVE vote here in November, and I probably won't be quiet the rest of the hour because um, that's what we've been talking about a lot about lately. But I think that's really the opportunity, Sam, with our facilities is that, you know, we can't let tradition drive just the facilities, right? We have to think about where we want to take teaching and learning, what we want education to look like, and our programming and those offerings should drive how we think about our facilities. Thank you. Um, we do have a, a viewer question uh, from Wanda Jacks, uh, Wanda, sorry, Wanda Johnson, Solutions Specialist and Owner at At Your Service Corridor Community. Um, and Wanda asks, uh, why does the mentioning or focus of exposing these skills, and I believe she's referring to professional skills uh, to students, uh, why doesn't that come up into, why, uh, <clears throat> why doesn't that come up before high school? I think it should start in elementary school. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that? I'd uh, applaud her right away. I think that's totally true, but it kind of comes back into this conversation of reinventing ourselves in education and really working and digging deep into these things that you know, students have had a voice about uh, through the pandemic, to be honest, and that's been exciting to be, to, I think, you know, it's, but 
if I were creating the best world of education, for sure, in elementary school, we would be talking and encouraging young people to think about their career in Iowa and what jobs are out there and how math and science and communication connect to those and bring those people into your classrooms and get them all jazzed about why we need them here and why we need them in these jobs. So the, that carries with them through their additional studies as they keep moving forward. Yeah, I agree, Lori. And uh, one, it's a great question. It's one we've been um, really trying to tackle head on here um, for a while at the Department of Education, but particularly over the last six months or so, um, we've uh, really started to rally around a singular priority area around future readiness. And future readiness is not new. That's been one of the governor's uh, priorities for a while now. And our work for community colleges and workforce development here at the department has been uh, deep into it. But what we're starting to ask now and pursue is what does future ready mean for a kindergartner? What does future ready mean for a third grader? Because we need to be thinking about the trajectory of learning and development for kids from the very beginning and how that uh, does connect into post-secondary opportunities of, we want kids to have choices when they're done with the, the PK-12 experience, right? And so that means we need to be thinking about the relevance of academic learning, social emotional development, um, not just in and of themselves, but how does that ultimately provide um, our students with choices when they're done with that part? <laughs> They, they've got um, opportunity and, and not feel like they're forced to do X, Y, or Z when they're done. So I would say, great question, absolutely agree. And that's why we're really um, trying to reorient ourselves around this notion of future readiness, starting right away as preschool, right, um, right away. And um, Matt, you were gonna say, well, I was just going to say, I think Brad, you know, summed it up nicely there that you got to look at what those different, you do have to break it all the way down to kindergarten or third grade and look at what those, how those skills, different skills translate and how you, you form those skills early. You know, we, we talk about that uh, students are going to go have to work in a, in a collaborative environment. Well, we can't be teaching group work for the first time in high school as a senior, right? And so when do you start to teach them those skills about, you know, effective responsibilities and, you know, carrying those things out and how to communicate with each other? Uh, and so those are all intentional things as a system that we do. And so you have a back end goal or those competencies like we talked about, one that we identified was adaptability. Well, how do we start to treat, try to teach perseverance, grit and adaptability early on, right? And those are social emotional skills that, uh, again, connect to that mental health conversation that we know as an institution we're taking on and trying to build, you know, resiliency in our kids as, the, as they work throughout. So. I think those are all important ones. And so I, I just say to the commenter's question, I think they're right. If you can't start in secondary school, if we're starting in secondary school, we're doing it too late. As I said, the, the institution education is primitive, you know what I mean? And so, again, I think those are just all, you know, getting great cracks in wine because that's something that, you know, I'm spinning my wheels. I don't really have the power to do it uh, per se, but like Matt, right? You know, like financial literacy. Why then not talk to our kids, you know, at an early age, you know, just the simplicities of money, right? And why it's important to save versus spend and how you invest and things of that nature. Because again, when you think about myself, right, uh, I come from a low income community. And so I always say to myself, if I wasn't an athlete, you know, I might not have went to college, right? Neither were my parents, um, you know, I really barely got out of high school, right? And so again, you think about those dynamics and how do we shift those cycles and those cultures of, uh, of poverty, right? I think it, it really, education is just such a major pillar in all those things. And so great question, because I totally agree we need to really be more proactive in what we deliver to our, our youth early. And then, you know, and the, uh, you guys didn't say this, but I know you're thinking the same thing. I, we've got to think about our teacher preparation and the experiences that they have early on and how those structures are put together so that they can bring that different thinking to the, our schools to help with transformation and this new vision versus trying to reteach, you know, once they get there. So that's another piece that we really need a lot of attention to, to help with this. And the earlier educators, you know, are um, no offense, but I think they tend to just because of the population be really nimble. Uh, that might be a really great place to start. Um, another question from Wanda. Um, she says, as a parent of a 10-year-old with an individual education plan, 
uh, and a resource provider, what can I do to help? I have her in Girl Scouts so she can be exposed to various topics, but I'm not sure if that's enough. I just, I just keep doing what you're doing, uh, Wanda. I think that, you know, for me, I think engagement is such a, a major component, right? And I think that giving children opportunity to experience many different things, because, um, you know, I, I, I say this all the time, but I don't even know if we had IEPs when I was in school, right? You know, and so now just to see the system of, you know, just the, the, the environment of students, you know, ADHD, all these different diagnoses of students, right, and things of that nature. I'm sure I had ADHD. I'm sure I probably need an IEP. I'm sure I probably, you know, was eligible for a lot of those different things. But I'm like, at this point, I know that, you know, the opportunity to be engaged in just as much as possible is important and just be consistent. And then also to hold, uh, you know, hold, hold the school district accountable, right? Make sure that, that you understand the, the plan, right? And that everything that is, is required in the plan is being fulfilled, so. Yeah, I, I guess I would add to uh, agree and um, be engaged, being active. And, you know, part of that whole IEP process is that decisions are made in teams. And uh, I don't know what your experience has been. Um, for some people, those teams are really effective. And for other folks, it just, it, things break down. And that happens when we're trying to, to move forward together uh, with a group of people to try to meet the needs of any student, um, including students with IEPs. So being part of that team, um, uh, you, uh, and again, I don't know your experience, but uh, you are an equal member of that team and have equal voice. And in some ways, an even uh, more powerful voice in that because you've, you've, got, you've got some say there in terms of what that's gonna look like. And I know, um, you know, uh, folks in, in Matt's district and Iowa City and around the state, we've got a lot of great educators and a lot of great IEP teams doing their best. Um, but it's it's a team effort. And so make sure that, that you're there, you're involved, and that you feel like and know that you're an equal part of that team and have that voice for your, for your child. Well, then I would add um, to that, Brad, anything that you can do that helps that child feel like they belong um, whether that's connecting them to those nonprofits that you just mentioned uh, that you're trying to do with the scouts or uh, any of those organizations, um, helping them know that they're okay no matter what uh, in that place where they're at and advocating for that to happen in the schools. If, if it's not already helping that uh, environment be part of the place that that student wants to stay in. Because uh, if they don't feel good about who they are, the learning is almost impossible. Yeah, I love what kind of where Lori's going there a little bit. I always, you know, one of the tenets I always try to live by is that all of our kids deserve to be part of something great, right? That they all deserve to have an outstanding experience. And and I think I think about that in my own life. Like, I'm not sure I was ever super great at anything other than having a lot of great experiences and a lot of great people around me, right? And then learning people and learning how to interact in groups and work with other people. And so I think one of the thing you're doing and talking about, you know, the one example you provide around Girl Scouts, or what are the different experiences you can just continue to provide? What are the things where the school can then support to give those experiences to? Uh, because the more great experiences that a child has an opportunity to be a part of, something's going to work there, right? Something's going to click, something's going to identify a passion area for them that they're going to develop and want to pursue and, and be able to go after. So I think you're doing a lot of the right things. And the first thing you're doing right is just being reflective on it, right? Like in consist, consistently asking that question and thinking about it, you know, are we doing enough or is this the right thing? Uh, but just trying to get as many great experiences or as many experiences uh, to um, be exposed to, I think from my own even personal experience was a benefit to me. Amen. And Wanda says, uh, I'm all over her IEP. <laughs> She says, I purposefully chose to move to Iowa 12 years ago because of the school system. I'm glad I did because having my daughter 10 years ago would have been different at this point in time if I lived where I was before. Good for you, Wanda. Good. Um, one thing that I'd like to, to talk about a little bit um, is, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about just how to help our students. Um, and a lot of that seems to fall on teachers uh, we already ask our teachers to do quite a bit, uh, you know, beyond just educating kids. 
um, you know, we, we, we put a lot of responsibility on them. And it seems like every time there's another crisis in this country, teachers get another job responsibility. Um, is there a way that we can uh, address these issues uh, and, and help teachers do more um, or find other ways. I know, to Carlos, you said uh, you work a lot with uh, resource counselors or, or guidance counselors to, to help students. Um, are there other ways that we can that we can do the, do this uh, and and give teachers resources that they need? I think I think um, for me it goes back, and that's something I, I talk about all the time, Sam. And it goes back even to my earlier comments that um, how do we support our teachers, right? And so. When we look at like buildings, I know our district and education in general is like, we need more black males, right? Um, and so when we look at a blue collar place like Iowa, um, again, I came from California. I mean, we, you know, again, we have to be strategic in how we, you know, help um, get those folks in those, in those buildings, right? Also with our teachers, I think, which what is huge, you know, for the institution of just education and teaching, man, you have to understand your why, right? Because when you go home um, and you look at your check, right, it's not always going to add up, right? But at the same time, for me, you know, I've been doing it long enough to where now you reap the benefits on the back end to where, you know, you see that you've that you had such a major impact. And I think for me, that's priceless, right? And so, again, understanding your why to where, again, you know, I do believe teaching is not for everybody, right? You know, but at the same time, for the folks that are invested in it and really have an interest and really educating our youth, I think that, again, how we support them and, and, and resources we provide for them is very, very important. I think that often comes in just like, because you look at a district like, like our district, uh, sometimes it gets a negative, you know, um, you know, perception just based upon the, the demographic of students. But at the same time, I think that if the students, um, you know, had the opportunity to have, you know, just more representation um, that our look and, and, and can understand their experiences, I think that is is a resource to teachers who might not understand that, right? And then as those teachers grow, because I think that, again, um, you know, some of my best teachers were white, right? So just being real, like I don't really have a color, uh, 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 just really interest as far as how to effectively educate, right? But again, I think that that missing piece sometimes can be filled by, again, those sort of support roles, as Matt said before, who might choose to work at Target, right? Versus actually helping but have, a, have the heart and passion to help, right? Because they do so many other things in the community, but at the same time, they got to feed their family, right? And I think that for me, that's the greatest resource that we can provide. You know, our teachers and our districts have just really been, been strategic and, and just really think outside the box and how we, we, we incorporate others, right? I think one thing we can do to support our teachers or support education in general that you know, I think we think about a lot is just how we talk about our schools in general, right? And how we talk about our public schools and what's the message we send. And a lot of times we do focus on the problems. We have a heck of a lot of work to do. We have a lot of areas we're not successful in. And I think we try to be very honest and transparent about what those challenges are and where we have a long ways to go to improve. But we do a heck of a lot of things right too that don't get measured, right? That don't get reported out or don't get documented and talked about. And, and I think it on a fundamental level, people want to see their institutions work for them. They just get frustrated when they don't, right? And they want the system to change and adapt. But we have some core need to want those things to work for us that we know as a society, we're better if it's effective. Our frustration or the anger we get from people is when they don't and when they're not making those improvements. But I do think if we want good people in the profession and we want good teachers to stay in the profession, we want good leaders to stay in the profession, we want to recruit those people at those entry level jobs to serve our kids, we have to be careful about the message we send around our schools and our public schools. Um, because a lot of the talk oftentimes is all of the challenges and opportunities, you know, in front of us and all the discouraging aspects rather than all of the good things we do. You know, it's it's pretty easy for a parent to say, well, my kid's teacher's great, but whoa, that school or whoa, that district, right? because I don't have a relationship maybe as close with those folks. And that's back to that relationship aspect. So, you know, one thing I would just ask for some grace on from people, and it's hard to do right now because we know that some of people's favorite watching right now has become school board meetings as we go through COVID, but is to give some grace, empathy, and compassion to those people that are working with their young people. They take that job very seriously uh, every single day when they come in and try to be their best for kids. But when we continue to send a negative message or negative connotation around where our schools have to get better and all of the deficiencies we have, I think that actually hurts 
the profession and the people that are willing to go into the, that profession and make that sacrifice too. So just an aspect there that's maybe a little larger than the, the question you're, you're asking, Sam, but I think something I think about a lot. I think it's so true though, um, Matt, when you're talking about um, what draws individuals into education, of course, the passion for kids, but also it's an opportunity to help have a voice in the change and moving forward and and what that could potentially look like for them. Uh, we've got, we know all of us here, there's a lot of red tape in systems, especially ones that have to be measured very um, to the finite hair. But when uh, those things can be freed up for our educators so that they don't have to feel like they've got this pressure to do things versus reach their kids, I think that that can really help. And many of our school districts, are, and I'd say the department too, are trying to free some of those things up as they're bubbling forward. Having that grace to allow all of that to happen and even make mistakes because we're not perfect in the process, um, but that always knowing the best interests of young people are in mind, it can be very helpful for us. That the teachers having an opportunity to transform along with the system, I think would be helpful that they can have even more of a voice um, and, and knowing too that um, that voice, that additional innovation, that additional work um, is being recognized and, and in, their, in their pocketbook too, um, as it keeps moving forward. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, nothing that's happened in the last two years has made this any easier for teachers and schools. Um, it's, it's already, it was already hard. We we're already asking teachers to do more and more with less and less uh, collectively in education um, before the pandemic. And the pandemic um, has just heaped that on. Um, so as we emerge here, hopefully from the, the pandemic, um, you know, agree with everything that's been said. And part of what we try to do with the Department of Education towards this end is, um, not send districts in 10 different directions with what they're supposed to do, <laughs> be it uh, in a law or not. Um, so some of that is us getting our house in order and being better at what we do. So there's a consistent vision and expectations that don't layer upon layer upon layer. So that's us needing to get our house in order and do a better job there at the Department of Education. Um, we've been on that journey and we'll continue to do so. Um, the other thing uh, I would say is, and it's related to that, um, is whenever we, we uh, I've often heard the analogy, we need to start taking things off of people's plates, or we need to start with an empty plate and put things on. And I just haven't seen anybody be able to use either of those metaphors to actually make something easier for somebody. <laughs> it's a good idea, but it's really hard to do. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I would say is what, what we actually need to do is set the plate down and um, look instead at um, what are we actually going to prioritize that's going to move the needle for kids' well-being at the end of the day? And a lot of good, good intent, well-intentioned people have got a lot of great ideas about that, but we can't do everything in the kitchen sink on this because uh, 15 good ideas is going to mean none of those good ideas get realized. So we're, we're going to have to get focused as a collective. It's not just Department of Education or districts. Districts are part of communities. And those communities are part of a larger state and we live in, a, in a, a global environment. So I guess I would say is we need to collectively get focused on what we're gonna prioritize because we cannot keep asking people to prioritize everything. And we add more to that list is when you try to prioritize everything, nothing's a priority. Yeah, I love that, Brad. I, I always think about that with like Hattie's research, right? And so yeah. most things we do in school work, they work on some level. The problem is, we need to figure out the things that work the most and have the biggest impact. Cause that's really, you know, when we speak about that time challenge, that's what we have the time to do. We only have time to do the things that matter the most and have the biggest impact. We don't have time to do things that just work a little bit, right. But trying to figure out and get that focus on those things that matter most, that's the, you know, that's the sauce, right. That's the recipe for us to try to figure out what's successful and trying to have the urgency around that piece. Cause there's a lot of things we like to do a lot of things that will have a positive impact but it's gotta be the things that matter the most and have the largest impact on our kids. I think that's a, the, the biggest thing you said, Matt, is sauce, right? That's, that's where we use a lot here is that, you know, again, everybody might have chicken, everybody might have barbecue, but it's the sauce, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody don't have the sauce. And that's, 
that's huge because again, I you know my daughter's in IJAG, Lori, um, my oldest daughter who I who I who started college and you know I said, hey, you know, if you're going to be collecting debt and, and not succeeding, you know what I mean, just go work, right? So she's been working for a couple of years. Now she said, hey, dad, I figure out what I want to do, right? What is that? I want to teach, right? So again, it's something that she's been around all her life, right? But I, you know, it came to her, so I know she's going to be excellent in that because again. That was something that you know um, she kind of understood her purpose, right? And I think again, when you when you have you know people have that sauce, and not to to my horns or dad, but that's all she has known is education and community, right? Again, it's it's what I've given my life to, right? And so therefore, I think that is something, as you said, too, with public schools. Like I, I, I'm I'm a firm believer in the public school system, right? I think that again, it, it better prepares kids for for life, and I, I debate that with anybody all day. So. <laughs> You just uh, got a few more minutes left uh, in our session. Matt, would you like to talk about the pebbles some more? Are you sure you want to ask that one, Sam? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thankful for the opportunity, but maybe just a couple things I'd reiterate to the listeners would be, you know, it's a 50% threshold. So we're not, uh, the last time the district asked for something like this, it was a general obligation bond. It was a 60% threshold to pass um, that vote. Uh, so it's a 50% threshold. Uh, we'd really like to encourage people to vote. There's no new tax impact to the to the community. It's really an extension of of two existing things in place, and it and it keeps us in a position of keeping all these folks that we've talked about here this afternoon in front of our kids and trying to do the right work. You know, if we don't have access to those resources, that's going to put additional strain on an already tight system uh, where we have educators trying to do good work for kids. We don't keep up with our buildings. We don't keep up with some of those life cycle projects. And then we end up in a situation like we were 10 years ago here in the district where we didn't have air conditioning or we didn't have appropriate HVAC. I mean, think about if we hadn't done all the HVAC upgrades leading up to this most recent global pandemic and the situation we'd been in, you know, then we'd have been buying HIPAA filters or, you know, for every single classroom instead of having taken that on. So it's forward thinking and progressive thinking. Another piece that we know has been important in the district is how we uh, think about climate action plan and, and some of our responsibility to the environment. And so we know that's an element that we continue to think about when we, when we, anytime we talk about our operations. But I think the key thing is to think about when we want to think about that next generation of experiences for our students and how that teach and learning piece needs to inform, you know, our, our facility conversations. That's the right way we should be having those conversations and, and how we should be looking at it. So again, November 2nd would encourage people to uh, to come vote, uh, check out the information on our district website. It breaks down the difference between PEPL and SAVE. And when we talk about a second facility master plan, the three different large buckets that we've broken into that from the, you know, completing the promise of FMP 1.0, what are the things we wanted to do we couldn't get to? How do we stay up on the life cycle projects is group two. And then group three is really this piece I keep coming back to about vision for the future and what do those things look like and what are the conversations our community needs to continue to have. But um, the, the real big point I guess I'd, I'd just like to leave the group with is as seconding to Carlos's uh, question there that public schools are our best answer and they're our, they're our best chance to to get this right for our kids and, and I think we have the right people there to do it. Um, I think we have the right educators committed to doing it. Um, we know that um, we have challenges and um, but I think we also have the right people to solve those challenges and I think if we affect mindset is the biggest thing we can we can do and affect those relationships there's no reason we can't you know crack this or, or create that special sauce to buy that barbecue to buy that chicken um, that's upon us and I think that's what we come to work trying to do every day one final question from Wanda thank you again Wanda for your uh, for your questions here she says uh, why don't all these resources or information about organizations go out to parents through the school system? even just a one sheet listing and a brief summary of each one, it gets overwhelming trying to know what organization to contact for whatever need you have. So many parents probably just stay quiet and won't ask. Yeah, I, I remember being in school and coming home with like a backpack full of flyers and you know, you had like your take home folder, your Friday folder, whatever you want to call it, right? We probably, probably lived through that experience a little bit. Ours is all digital now. And so it's called Peach Jar. And I think that would be a great resource, you know, if you're an Iowa City uh, parent wanted to, um, I'm sure other districts have a similar venue, but um, I, that's our best tool that we try to get information out to parents around those different ones. But as far as evaluating those, I mean, again, I'm sure uh, those folks that are involved in your IEP team meeting and trying to think about the different opportunities for kids, if you have a list of those opportunities or an idea about 
if any of those, I'm sure they would be happy to talk to you about those opportunities or, or your building principal, you know, that would have some experience with some of those different groups and organizations to say, hey, this, this one might be a great fit, right? Or these two or three might be ones you should want to pursue. So don't be afraid to ask, you know, the educators in your student life those questions. They're connected to your communities. They're probably connected to the people offering those opportunities. Um, but ours is a virtual backpack is kind of how we refer to it. It's peach jar flyers and a lot of things get posted for information purposes in there. Uh, all right. Uh, well, I'd like to say thank you to all of our panelists, uh, Brad, Lori, Matt, DeCarlos. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Inclusive ICR for sponsoring this panel. Um, I, I hope it was informative and interesting. I'd like to thank you, Wanda, for all your wonderful questions. Um, and thank you for, for spending uh, part of your late afternoon with us. Um, so uh, once again, uh, thank you for joining us at the Iowa Ideas Conference. Uh, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Thank you. Sam.